Hi, everyone. My name is Avery with the University of Florida Conference Department. We're going to get started here in just a few minutes. Um, please be sure to use the chat function and the Q&A function within the Whova desktop application. The Zoom chat will be open as well, but if you put them in Whova, we'll be able to go back and revisit them because um, they will stay tied to the session. If you're having any technical difficulties or issues, um, just reach out to myself or Katie or Kevin or Lauren here from the conference department. We'll be on here all day. And we'll go ahead and get started in just a minute. Kevin, can you go back to, oh, oops. Okay, well, participants are still coming in. I think we can start. Welcome everybody to this uh, session three uh, with the, uh, the title Specimen Data Provision and Mobilization. Uh, this is a session about the uh, DISCO community e-services and standards. Um, I'm your moderator and my co-moderator is uh, Sharif Islam. And we are of course grateful for the uh, tech support from the University of Florence uh, conference team. Um, as you probably have noticed, this session will be recorded for later viewing. Um, a word for the uh, uh, presenters of the presentations, please uh, speak slowly and clearly for our international uh, attendees. Um, I wish to thank uh, all of you for joining us. Um, each presenter will uh, present uh, for about 10 minutes and there will be a few minutes for questions uh, at the end of each presentation. Uh, also at the end uh, of the session, we may have uh, some time for further questions. Please use the uh, Devova platform to, to, uh, to ask your questions. And then this can be either answered within the session or, or after the sessions by the, the presenters. Um, as uh, was uh, already um, uh, uh, mentioned, the, uh, there are two uh, chats available. Um, please use the chat uh, in, in Vova uh, so that uh, uh, people uh, looking at the chat after the meeting can still see it and, and um, try to ignore the chat uh, in, in, in Zoom. Um, so, Please bear in mind for any technical difficulties, uh, difficulties that we may have and uh, enjoy this the session. Uh, I would uh, start with a presentation. So I'm now going to share my screen. Um, my presentation uh, is a bit an introduction to the, the other presentations in the session. Uh, I will give a, a global, uh, a, a, a short overview of these, the DISCO e-services, uh, the rationale behind them, um, and, and how this could serve the, uh, the global community needs. And I will also shortly mention the, uh, the related uh, TETIC standards um, that are uh, being created to support these, uh, these services. You will hear more about uh, these in the other presentations. Um, as you all know, um, we have um, some uh, big global challenges uh, currently in, in the world, uh, tenses around the loss of biodiversity and threats to our own uh, living conditions. Um, these are related to, to environmental changes, climate change, to depletion of raw materials, food security issues, health and well-being. And in these global challenges, uh, the, the specimens, these specimen collections held in the, uh, the institutions um, could play or have to play uh, a vital role. Um, the specimens you can see as the, the tangible um, objects um, that you can look at, that you can feel, that you can touch, 
uh, that you can study um, that, that act as kind of time capsules uh, to which you can go back in time and, and see how um, the specimens uh, were in, in the past. Uh, some of the collections are 300 years old. Um, they also, they can be studied for, for their uh, phenotypic characters, but sometimes also for the genetic uh, characters. Um, and uh, they are also uh, playing a, a, an essential role as being um, the um, foundation for the uh, Linnean names that are being used uh, to, um, uh, to find uh, species related information in, uh, in, in, in database systems uh, worldwide. Um, these, these global challenges require multidisciplinary interconnected information and tools. And um, so one of the um, major goals of, of our services is to make uh, the specimen um, data, the specimen collections, um, technically able to become interconnected uh, with this multidisciplinary information. So looking at, at the global community needs, who are our main stakeholders? These are the, the researchers, um, these are the, uh, the collection providing institutions themselves. And uh, last but not least, there are also the, the data infrastructures that deal with uh, specimen or specimen related uh, information. The key goals um, for uh, our e-services are, um, first of all, uh, as I already told you, to make the specimen data interoperable, to connect uh, these with derived and related data, but also to improve the access to the collections, both the access to the physical collections, uh, as well as the access to the uh, digital available uh, information. And um, the third key goal is to improve the rate and quality of the digitization. I will go through these, uh, these three uh, key goals, starting uh, with the first one. Um, to, to serve this, this goal to make the specimen data interoperable uh, and to connect it with derived and related data, uh, such as genomic data, uh, morphological data, uh, species interactions data, ecological data, etc. We want to create um, a new kind of object on the internet, uh, which we call digital specimens, uh, which are the actionable and extensible units. Extensible because they can be uh, extended by uh, all kinds of related uh, or derived information, and actionable because we want the, uh, the wider community to be able to create these, these items to add annotations and, and, and further information. As, uh, as the community uh, uses this uh, digital specimen information. We want to build that on a fair digital object infrastructure. Uh, fair digital objects are um, uh, a very simple way to, um, to represent data. Um, they, con uh, they consist of, of data plus metadata or metadata alone. Uh, that metadata includes the type of the objects uh, and the operations that are possible on the objects and a permanent identifier. Um, and uh, this infrastructure um, should allow us to move away from a system-centric world where you need to go to individual siloed um, database systems to, 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 to um, uh, get access to the data to an information-centric world where it doesn't matter anymore where the data is, but you will always be able to access it. Um, we want to make this um, as, as open as possible, but also as close as, as that is legally necessary. So we want to implement also authentication and authorization services that should enable you to um, still get access to information that is um, uh, legally not fully open because um, uh, there are, for instance, uh, problems with uh, the protection of species that you don't want to review the exact location of the, the species uh, to, to everybody, but on, only to the uh, researchers that should have access to that information. Why fair this to objects? Uh, it's a question that is uh, asked us uh, many times. So uh, a little bit uh, more information about that. Uh, we are very enthusiastic about uh, fair this to objects because um, they, uh, they rep represent a promise, a promise to support the data revolution. 
as you all know, um, the, the, uh, the amount of data worldwide is growing very fast. And we really need to, um, to move from um, an approach that we share data sets um, and that we, we move these data sets around um, to go to a more distributed data processing uh, way. Uh, that we go from sharing data, uh, sharing data sets to visiting uh, the data where the data is actually held. Um, FAIR, as you know, means findable, accessible, interoperable, and use reusable, but you can also read FAIR as fully artificial intelligence ready. Um, this means that um, we want to have these digital objects uh, accessible and, and uh, actionable, not only by humans, but also by machines. So that machines can use the information to uh, extract uh, new information, uh, which then can be used by, by humans again. Um, as data travels in, in context, uh, you always need to, to have the context uh, about the data. Uh, we want to transform also the, these digital entities into meaningful entities, meaning that we uh, want to, uh, to add metadata that describes the, the entities describe the type, but also describes the, the provenance uh, when, when the, the data is, is, uh, is uh, uh, transformed um, and, and used by, by systems, and, 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 and etc. Um, to compare FDO, the fair digital objects infrastructure with the internet, um, the internet is an abstraction layer that kind of binds networks together to make it look like a single network. And um, as was also presented uh, earlier uh, this week in the uh, International uh, Science Conference, uh, the, um, the promise of that was in the, in the 80s to, uh, you should be able to plug in a computer and then just be connected to the internet without any hassle. Um, and FDO has a, a same kind of promise, um, it binds to, gather the data to make it looks like a single fabric of data. And you should be able to plug in your data set or data repository and just be connected to this data fabric. Um, how does that look like? Um, fair digital uh, objects uh, are represented as, as simple JSON objects. Um, we want to, uh, to fully support um, um, uh, semantic web technology. So we want to uh, express that as uh, JSON-LD objects. And uh, from this example, uh, you, you can see a, a few uh, things. So you can see that uh, these objects have, uh, have identifiers. You see that the object itself has an identifier, but you also can see in this example, uh, an, an identifier for the institution, for instance. And you also see that it has provenance information. Um, for the, uh, the um, DISCO infrastructure, we are working on a, a, a framework to do the modeling for these, uh, these objects. Um, we created that in, in Wikibase and we created a, a service that we can um, transform these in check schemas that we can then use to, uh, to validate, to semantically validate the, the objects once they are created or updated. For the contents of the, the digital specimens, um, we, uh, we rely on, uh, uh, on the development of TETIC uh, MITS. Um, uh, these are in, uh, this, uh, developed in the wider context of the open uh, digital specimen specification that uh, DISCO is working on. And MITS is the minimum information of a digital specimen. You will hear more about that in the next presentation. Um, and what we want to do here is to go beyond uh, the tra traditional <coughs> Tetwick Darren core in that we want to be able to share the, the, the uh, objects um, as early as possible, as, as soon as they are um, existing, uh, actually, even before that we have scientific, scientifically relevant uh, data. Um, so how does a digital specimen look like? This is a, a very simple, um, uh, representation, you can see it as a container on the internet um, that, uh, that contains uh, uh, what we call uh, authoritative sector information. Uh, that is the, the, the mid-level metadata that, that uh, is derived from the, the collection management systems. 
but it can also uh, contain uh, data from other local sources in the institution, for instance, loans and visits uh, uh, data, uh, and even, uh, for instance, uh, sensor data from uh, the, the storage conditions of the, the physical specimen. Um, it can also contain uh, all kinds of annotations, uh, and it can contain uh, data from external sources uh, related to the, the species, if it's a biological specimen, or the, the site information, for instance. Uh, this is another view. Um, here you see that we want to create these, these objects uh, as soon as um, there is the gathering event, as soon as the object is collected in the fields. Um, we would like to have uh, the, the objects already created. And then during the life cycle of the physical specimen, we want to use that object to add more and more information. And even after uh, the existence of the physical object, for instance, because it's, it's getting lost, uh, uh, here it's displayed in the fire, uh, then we still want to maintain that uh, digital um, uh, object uh, on the internet and be able to add further information to that. Let's go to the key to the second key goal. Um, the, or the other key goal is to improve the access to the collections. Uh, currently, if you want to go to the collections, you need to go to the individual institutions in Europe to find out what they have and how, uh, how the access works. Um, we want to, pro uh, to provide the European collections as one virtual collection uh, descript described by the, uh, the Latimer core. You will hear more about that uh, in, the, in the next presentation. Um, we want to provide um, a unified uh, system for loans, visits, and uh, digitization on demand services. We call that Elvis. Um, and we want to, to improve the determination speed and accuracy through uh, specimen data refinery services. Um, also, we want to, to provide a, a collections monitoring dashboard where you have an overview of the collections described by the TEDWIC CD standard. Um, so that you can see the digitization status, uh, the strength of a collection, etc. And we uh, have developed a, a knowledge base uh, service uh, where uh, we want to store all the uh, relevant information. Our last key goal um, is to improve the rate and quality of digitization. Um, so uh, we want to uh, assist with digitization at the individual institutions through the specimen data refinery services. Um, individual institutions should be able to provide just the, the image of, of a specimen and then the refinery services can extract uh, the label information and, and all kinds of other information from, uh, from the images. Um, we want to uh, provide information services to, uh, to aid the prioritization of digitization, uh, which needs, for instance, information on how the collections are used, uh, uh, which, which collections are often used in, in loans and visits, etc., where the types are, etc. Uh, and we want to provide digitization on demand to improve responses to urgent uh, scientific needs. For instance, where there is a situation that there is a new virus like the COVID-19 virus that uh, needs urgent access to uh, part of the collections. Currently, less than 10% of the estimated uh, 1.5 billion specimens is digitized. Um, so there is, uh, is a lot uh, to do here. Okay, this was my presentation. Thank you. I will now stop sharing. Thank you, Walter. Uh, there is a question on the Zoom chat uh, about your new interpretation of FAIR, the fully artificial uh, intelligence ready. And uh, the question is, what could be the best argument that you could provide to a FAIR skeptical administrator to help promote the allocation of resources in order to secure funding to these services uh, you present? Especially uh, DISCO is EU-centric and people outside of the EU. Yeah, um, that uh, that argument uh, of fair is is of course in the reusability and um, uh, this 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 uh, second definition of fair that I've given here 
is an argument towards being able to, to um, make better use of machines uh, in the future um, to, to make uh, full use of that scientific information and to have artificially uh, intelligence uh, software uh, algorithms to help the scientific community to um, respond faster to, uh, to urgent uh, questions that there are. Okay. There's another question is, uh, as open as possible, as closed as necessary, uh, can you explain uh, what data will be as closed as necessary? Um, that will uh, be data, uh, especially that uh, is sensitive for some reasons. Um, so for some collections, um, the objects uh, are very valuable. Uh, like mineral collections with, uh, with, with minerals like gold and platinum, um, you may want to not review the exact uh, location. Uh, you can have biological uh, collections where you uh, have uh, rare species, where you don't want to review the exact uh, uh, location where the, uh, the, the specimen uh, was, was found. Uh, this kind of information uh, you would uh, like to share with these researchers that should have access to that, but not with everybody. So you need to be uh, authorized to in order to have access to this kind of information. Okay, I think uh, we can move on to the next session, next uh, speaker. Okay. Next speaker will be Elspeth Haston. Hi, thank you very much. So I'll just uh, share my screen. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so as as Vouter said, I'm going to um, give a bit more information about the the MIDS, which is the minimum information about a digital specimen. So um, I first came to work on the on the development of the of the mid-standard um, when I was asked to provide a measure of the number of specimens digitized for the CTAF institutes. And this was for the strategic target. Um, and then we realized that in order to do that, there was quite a bit of work needed. So I um, joined a, a fantastic group of people in the, um, when we started the MIDS task group um, within the TADWIG community. And essentially, this talk is giving me the, the chance to give an update um, of the progress that we've made to develop the, the standard um, and where we are now. So, is that going to work? Sorry. Uh, I'm just trying to get the screen to move. You okay. also have, the, yeah, you have the arrows at the bottom too. Yeah. Can you that way? Right. I'll try that too. Thank you. Um, so, first of all, key point about digitization. So, digitization in this concept is the essentially the um, within MIDS is that it's the conversion of the analog information um, into a digital form. But um, the key part of this is making it publicly available. So that is a is one of the key points of of MIDS and the digitization within MIDS. So. Um, the other thing about the MID standard is that it is a minimum information to be captured. And that means that um, it is the minimum information and, um, that's possible, but it's also um, very much um, encouraged um, to include more information um, with each specimen record. Um, but at least we've got the minimum information expected is, um, is clearly defined within the MIDS, uh, within the MID standard. Um, so you can see there's three uh, three basic well three levels of mids, um, including a, a kind of zero level, which is the the pre digitization level really. Um, so the one that we've been um, focusing most on um, at, at present is mids level one. Um, but if I just give a little bit more information about the about the levels, so I think the, what's really important is that we need to be clear. Um, about the 
information elements that we are selecting um, to form the mid standard. Um, and hopefully I, this um, talk is going to give a little bit more in, uh, insights about that. Um, at a very basic level, the three MIDS levels can be characterized. So MIDS level one, uh, which is the basic level of digitization. Um, this is something that a lot of institutes will refer to as um, a stub records or skeletal records or minimum data records. This is this is essentially what MIDS level one is, is, um, is for. And it can be also considered as kind of virtual cabinet um, and that this is often the first phase of digitization that takes place. Sorry, I, I'm sorry, if, if we've got phones going here, so I'm hoping that's not gonna, you're still gonna be able to hear my voice over the top of them. Um, so the first phase of digitization is carried out very often as a batch process um, based on the um, specimen folder or the insect or mineral drawer. And so hope someone's going to answer the phone soon. <laughs> so the digital records, therefore, can represent um, a curatorial structure online and they allow the, the users to virtually browse the collection by folder or by drawer. Mids level two, which is the regular um, level, that's um, really what we're talking about is research ready. We're, we're including the information, the data that are considered to be the highest priority for, for most specimen based research. And then mids level three is really when we're getting into the kind of the open digital specimen kind of area with the extended data. So um, each um, mids level um, we've, is really defined at the moment by the, the presence of um, the information in the data records, um, but also um, you would indicate the presence of, uh, of an image associated with that record or other me multimedia. So, so as I've said, um, the the concept of um, MIDS is that this, this, the information and the data have to be um, digitized and published online. Um, but it's really important to think about um, the, the context of that um, and where they are available online because um that may that may differ in different online resources so the this the context of where the specimens are published um can be considered as profiles and at the moment the primary profiles that uh, we're focusing on are are those of for example gbif and geocase so they're the the um most widely uh, accessible and most e uh, easiest to measure um and, and also, as I said, where uh, most digital specimens are, are potentially accessed. So additional profiles that could, could be considered are Darwin Core Archive or um, the institutional uh, portals um, and, of course, DISCO. Um, so I think that, that's, that's a really important point, though, is, is the context of where the, the specimens um, have been published and where they are available, um, because Essentially, what you might find is that there may be more and more data um, for that specimen on an institutional portal, which means that that um, that specimen may achieve a mids level two, for 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 example, on the institutional portal, um, and there may be less data available on the external portal, such as GBIF, and it may just uh, achieve mids level one there. So the context or the profile is going to be really important. Um, there's also the in some cases, the institution may not have uh, a portal available to them, and all their data may be, for example, in GBIF. In which case, it would the the mids level would be higher in the in the GBIF GBIF profile. So, um, so as I said, we're really focusing on um, the finalising mids level one, um, and there have been some some. Uh, <laughs> quite interesting discussions um, about the elements um, within this within this level. Um, one, um, one thing I've done in, in here, I'm not going to go through all of this, I, um, but I wanted to show that there's been some, some thought and consideration about the elements and why um, they've been selected 
to form part of um, each mids level, um, in particular mids level one. Um, as I've said, this is uh, the mids level one is often the first step of mass digitization, um, and and most information at this level is really recorded at higher curatorial um, level than the individual specimen. Um, obviously, other than the specimen identifier. Um, and this has very much been a balance between the, the ideal of what we're looking for in the longer term and the pragmatic of what is actually achievable at the moment with the data that are being recorded and made available. Um, so what we have been working on um, is the um, using the implementation conformance statement um, and uh, as an aid for institutes. So these can give institutes a guideline of um, what information to publish and how the fields can be mapped um, to a particular profile such as GBIF. Um, it can also be um, a tool to assess the extent of conformance um, at present. Um, identifying areas for attention um, and it's also a sort of declaration of conformance by a data publisher um, and finally what um, it's it can be used at the moment as a tool for harmonizing towards a common set of minimal inf minimum information so here's an example of um, the conformance statement for for mids level one um, as you can see there's been some discussion uh, there's three um, elements um, object type, material type, preparation type, we are now looking at replacing those with a single element. Um, and there's some, still some discussion about what the, what the title of that element would, would be. Um, something like the uh, curatorial, um, curatorial uh, unit type or object type. I mean, there's, there's um, some options there that we're just going to be finalizing uh, shortly. Um, so what I've been in discussion. I'm really grateful to um, a number of um, people in some uh, data managers and curatorial, curatorial managers in in um, quite a few different institutes that we've had one to one discussions with to go through this. Um, and there's some really been some quite valuable insights coming up um, as part of that, um, including um, the fact that some data may be, be, be being exported to GBIF, but not necessarily appearing on GBIF because of the, the, the mapping is not um been um completely successful so um it's highlighting some of the some of the work to be done um so one thing that has become very clear is the, the development of the mids um standard really needs to engage not only with with the collection man data managers but also with the um database and aggregator developers um because um we need to make the data available but um they need to be able to be publishable and accessible. So, um, what I wanted to do is just show the kind of the, um, for the fundamental um, placement of MIDs within within digitization, and I think it really sits at the heart of um, digitization, um, the, all the different processes, um, and that's you know, whether it's the um, in terms of funding, whether it's explaining to funding body that. Um, Digitization to mids level one doesn't mean everything's completely digitized. Um, that is just to mids level one, and more funding will be required to increase the the, the level of digitization. Um, and it should be hopefully easier to to make some of those arguments when we've got the the standard. So finally, I just wanted to say that um, the the mids task group. Um, is working actively on this um, and there's going to be a, a meeting um, coming up um, following in, in November as part of the, the MIDS uh, working sessions, uh, sorry, the Tadwig working sessions. So we would really appreciate um, and welcome um, input and also for people to try out those um, conformance statements for their own collections and give us some feedback and we can be making those available to people for, for testing. And finally, I just wanted to say um, some thanks to quite a few people who've been been helping with this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Can you stop sharing your screen? Yes, thank you. Um, I see no 
questions in the platform. So let's go to the next uh, presentation. Um, Matt Woodburn. Great, thank you. Let's just get the screen share going. Okay, can you, sorry, see the right screen there? Yes, you can see the slides. Okay, I'll take those, yes. Yes, kind of it's okay. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, so yeah, hi everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about the upcoming Tadwig Collection Description Standard, which as Radha mentioned, is now named Latimer Core and its potential application to DISCO e-services. So my aims today very briefly are to introduce the standard, so what it contains and how it can be structured. And then secondly, to walk through at a quite a high level, some initial thought processes on how it might be applied to DISCO. So as mentioned, Latimer Core is the new data standard for describing, annotating and quantifying um, both digitized and undigitized natural science collections. It's been developed by a task group within the uh, collection descriptions interest group in Tadwig, and there's a fair amount of history and background behind it, which we don't really have time to go into today. But however, if you're interested in finding out more, there's plenty of information on our GitHub repo and previous presentations that we're more than happy to share with everybody. So after much discussion, the standard has now been named after Marjorie Courtney Latimer, who's best known for bringing the coelacanth to the attention of the world back in 1938. So at that time, she was also a museum curator in East London, South Africa, and hence the link into collection descriptions. Um, perhaps more importantly, she might also help us to start addressing some of the gender balance in Tadwig standards and counterbalancing um, for the Darwins and the Audubons that are already out there. Um, in terms of the status of the standard, it's now in the last throes of preparation for the Tadwig review process, and then hopefully uh, moving on to ratification as a formal standard. So here's an overview of what's in the standard. Um, we currently have 20 classes and 109 properties spread across those classes. And the central concept to get your head around is the object group there in the middle. So as the name might suggest, this class represents the concept of the collection within the standard, but in the sense that it can be any group of more than one collection objects. So from an entire museum's collection to maybe just a few objects in a, uh, a box or a drawer. And the object group class itself contains a list of at the moment 24 properties that describe the group and the objects within it. We also have a set of more complex or hierarchical classes that describe the object group, which is shown here in green on the left. And then a set of classes at the bottom um, in the purple that are more to do with custodianship and tracking of the collections. On the right and in the dark blue um, are a set of more generic classes such as identifiers, people and references that can potentially be attached to a number of the other classes in the standard. And above that, a measurement or fact class, which we've uh, pinched from Darwin Core and ABCD. Um, that can be used for dynamically defining quantitative metrics and textual narratives about the collection. And then finally, at the top in the light blue are a set of classes that are more related to the structuring of the data itself, making it fair and um, machine actionable. Now, modeling how those classes can be structured and interlinked is a fairly complex task for collection descriptions. And after starting off with a fairly rigid set of rules, we then moved more towards making it more flexible as different ways that you structure the data allow you to achieve different goals. So working down the list on the left, you can begin with quite a simple approach. So creating one object group for a collection and adding a bunch of tags to describe the contents of that object group using one or more attributes such as taxonomy or geographic origin. If you want, you can then add some metrics to quantify the object group. For example, the number of objects and tags are represented. If you then want to get more detailed, you can also start quantifying the relationships with the attributes representing, for example, how many objects there are of each taxon or from each country. And then if you want to move towards a really rich quantitative data set of your collection, then you can split your single object group out into multiple object groups, each representing subsets of the overall collection. And you can also add then metrics and descriptions to those. The increasingly detailed options open up more opportunities in the sense of, or in terms of reporting and analytics that you can do about your collections, but they do also involve increasing levels of effort in generating and managing the data. So there is a trade-off there. So it's really about deciding what you need and what's achievable in your particular use case and structuring things accordingly, which is an important thing for us to remember going into the DISCO use case. 
And these options, however, do open up the potential for a, a workflow where you can increase the amount of detail that you have about your collections over time as and when time and resources permit. So now we want to look at how this applies to Disco services. So as um, Rauter has mentioned, there are quite a lot of plans for services and components. Um, but the ones we want to focus on at the moment are the European Loans and Visit System, Elvis, um, the Collections Digitization Dashboard, or CDD, and the European Collection Objects Index, or ECOI. And these are the ones either in the most advanced state of development or with the most obvious collection descriptions components. Starting with Elvis, um, so the first version of the system is already live, as uh, Sharif will tell you about um, after this. Um, and it's holding data about institutions, facilities, people, and transactions. Um, however, there is a planned collections component to be added in later versions from next year. And here you can see um, extracts from some mockups of future Elvis interfaces showing data for institutional collections, and also some more granular breakdowns and tags to provide better collections discovery. The breakdowns are intended to be carried out according to classification schemes that were developed in 2019 as part of iStick, which was uh, the Disco design project. And secondly, we have the CDD, which was prototyped, prototyped like Elvis as part of the Synthesis Plus program. And this was designed to provide a more detailed quantitative breakdown of collections against a number of attributes, and also to be able to provide a measure of digitization completeness against the estimated total holdings within and across institutions. To do this, it incorporates both estimated numbers of objects, digitized or undigitized, and it also adds metrics um, for number and completeness of digital specimen records based on those MIDS levels that, um, that Elspeth's just described. And crucially, it's also based on the same classification scheme as the Elvis components um, from iStig, which indicates to us that these two collection description schemes can at least be interrelated. So looking at the bigger picture, we know that collection descriptions in Elvis and the CDD may have some different use cases, but they also have many common components. We also know that the main data store for Disco services will be ECOI, which will contain the digital objects relating to specimens, institutions, facilities, people, and so on. And it will serve this data up as required to relevant services. We can also make an educated guess that digital collections ultimately need to be linked to digital specimens and also linked to the same institutions, people, et cetera, as the digital specimens are. So it makes sense to approach DISCO collection descriptions as a single implementation to go into ECOI rather than siloed implementations in the separate services. So we have a standard which is broad, permissive, and flexible in how it's structured. How do we come up with a design using Latimer Core, which will work well for a DISCO implementation? Effectively, we want to create a profile within the standard which constrains which parts of it we use, how we make them interoperable, and how we structure them most effectively to deliver on the requirements. So firstly, which parts of the standard are we likely to need? So from the design work done in iStig, from the Elvis design and build work, um, from prototyping the collections digitization dashboard and also some knowledge of the ECOI architecture, we know that there are a number of classes and also properties within the object group and other classes that are just not relevant at the moment to those use cases. So we can remove them and that immediately gives us, um, starts to give us a simpler looking profile. Then we need to look at how we standardize the data to make it consistent and comparable. And then as with almost any data set, control vocabulary is really the key. Luckily, much of the hard work um, was done in iStick and Synthesis to agree and refine the common, common uh, classification schemes that map pretty well to the relevant properties and classes in Latimer Core. And then secondly, we need to define the metrics that are needed um, so that they can also be applied consistently across the board. For the CDD, these are, as mentioned, counts or estimates of the total number of objects within each classification with measures of confidence attached and mid levels to indicate the presence and completeness of digital records. And these can both be defined and stored using the measurement or fact class. And then we really get to the tricky bit. So with these schemes in mind, how do we structure the data? Starting with the Elvis case, um, we know that uh, we want to store an institutional level collection for each institution. That might have quite a lot of data attached um, with much of it coming through interoperability with the CTAF registry of collections. And it might also include basic metrics um, represented by the measurement of fact class again. But we also have a two tier breakdown within the institutional collections using the object groups discipline property and the object classification class of the standard. So as you can just about see here, um, 
zoology vertebrates slash birds is one of those breakdowns. And then for each of these subcollections, we want to be able to tag them to say that they include certain preparation types or they come from these geological time periods or so on. And one way to do this is to create an additional object group for each subcollection, link them to the parent institutional collection, and then use the relevant Latimer, courses, uh, Latimer core classes to tag them. When we then get onto the CDD use case, we can see that actually it's pretty much the same kinds of breakdown. Um, but we want to add some more detailed metrics to those breakdowns so we can generate dynamic dashboards, reports and visualizations from more structured quantitative data. And it may be that this can be achieved fairly simply by just adding metrics, again using measurement or fact, to both the object groups representing the subcollections and also to the relationships between the object groups and their tags. And the benefit there is it will be working from one kind of data structure, but one that can also be built up over time to feed into the dashboard and as and when institutions have the time and resources to provide those more detailed numbers. So to quickly go back to the checklist, we have at least a high level picture of the data we need, we have a set of standard vocabularies and metrics, um, and an idea on structuring the data, which gives us a rough collection descriptions profile for the DISCO services covered. So that's the first step, which of course needs mining into in much more detail. But what else do we need to think about to move towards an actual design and implementation? And the answer is there's quite a lot more to think about than we have time to get into today, but they do at least need a mention. So firstly, we'll need to work out how to implement Latimer Core in the eco architecture, which means serializing it in JSON and seeing how we can align it with digital object architecture. We also need to make the data interoperable, not only with other digital objects and ECOI, but also with other infrastructures in the global collection descriptions ecosystem, and especially that uh, tight interoperability with CTAF. And robust PIDs are probably a major piece of that puzzle. And finally, we'll need to figure out how to how user interfaces and middleware tools like the um, Internet uh, Publishing Toolkit um, can work with implementations of Latimer core data. So there are still some very big topics to get our heads around. And on that note, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. And I just want to say thanks to the session organizers um, and to the many people who have contributed to Latimer Core development over the years and also to the, um, some programs that have funded some of the activity. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, Matt. Um, uh, I think there is... No, I don't see any questions related to this presentation. So let's go on to the um, next presentation, Sherif. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I will be talking about uh, Elvis, European Loans and Visit System, and our experience with the TA and VA call. And I'm currently working at Netralis, uh, part of the DISCO project as the data architect. Elvis is currently uh, part of the EC-funded, European Commission-funded Synthesis Plus project. And the goal is to build the one-stop shop for researchers to provide access to uh, millions of specimens and both physical and digital access. And last year we had a presentation about Tadwick. You can find that there and also uh, the Elvis website and the GitHub page has more information about the project. Some specific services we're tackling now is partly the first one is the hosting the competitive calls. These are basically project applications that you can apply for funding. And I'll, I'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, different types of uh, collection access uh, and visits. And for that, we need the collections information, lab and facility equipment lists, make them uh, discover discoverable and searchable, and also allowing users to see uh, who the relevant points of contact at any institution. Basically a list of users, roles, again, make it searchable, of course, with privacy and GDPR in mind. Elvis 1.0 was released in March, and this was a development collaboration with a company called Picture A. It's uh, based in the Netherlands. And we provided a service for the transnational access, which is basically a application to fund short-term visits to the consortium institutions in Synthesis Plus. We also worked on a virtual access call. That's to fund digitization on demand requests. And at the same time, when we were designing we, uh, and dealing with the calls, we also had to move from
from the previous uh, synthesis portal to Elvis. So, so there were a lot of uh, extra work uh, involved uh, during this time. We started with the user stories uh, almost uh, two years ago with the uh, surveys and uh, workshops. And uh, even before Corona, we had regular Zoom meetings and we continued those Zoom meetings uh, during the lockdown. And these user stories uh, guided us uh, during our discussions and also uh, in the development process. We generated uh, wireframes and there were sprints uh, we went through uh, uh, based on the discussions we had and specific uh, milestones. And here are a few examples of the wireframes that we discussed during the meetings. Uh, again, we went through various iterations, you know, where to put text, what to include or not. Um, and then here's an example screenshot from the current live system, where you can see we have tabs for institution, collections, calls, calls where we go to find out what you can apply for. And the requests are the applications that you submit. The collection is the one that uh, Matt just talked about that will include uh, in the later version. And of course, uh, we used GitHub extensively to coordinate some of our testing. And this was a group effort uh, within the work packet six and with the developers. And as you can see here, we made use of uh, different tags to, to uh, indicate bugs and testing and what has been resolved or not. And these are currently open in publicly available in GitHub issues. A few numbers uh, for the TA call. This is the transnational access. Uh, the physical access, uh, we received 493 applications, and that is requesting almost 6,000 user days of access uh, to the infrastructures of the Synthesis Plus Consortium. And this could be collections, labs, facilities, whatever the uh, uh, institutions are providing. 143 projects has been funded, and that amounts to 1,721 user days. And of course, the system is working, but there's a lot of things going, going on behind the scenes. Uh, it's very important uh, to recognize these people, especially the, the TAP administrators and people that scored the project uh, for the review were very important for the process. And for the virtual access call, again, these are the digitization requests. We received 32 requests and that involves 20 VA providing partners in Synthesis Plus. And the uh, range was huge and we had one proposal with just one institution, but we had one with 13 institutions various ranges of budgets and taxonomy subject area and we also had an external panel looking at this application so the results of these will be published soon and again the VA coordinators and the external panel were, were very important uh, for this uh, effort so the big picture here uh, why do you want to do this uh, specifically specifically to create this unique visit ids and and ensuring that all visits can be tracked and linked with the research output. So that's very important for this project. And also, also the scope of collaboration is changing in, in, in the workflow. Now in the application process, you can name more than one institution. So when you submit, you can pull in information from different institution and make a coherent research case. And when the administrators and the selection panel look at looking at it, they're looking at it in a very integrated research case where you can see collection and experts are collaborating across uh, Europe. And synthesis uh, delivering these uh, research visits and the idea is to in a short space of time, you know, we, we exploit collections, we build uh, collaboration across borders. And of course, international visits are also possible. These are for researchers from outside of the European research area. And this also shows that demand of our European collections are enormous. And this is perhaps one of the most important reason why we, we need this one stop European wide access platform. Uh, for, for this kind of services. While we're thinking about this and designing and implementing, we, we had to be flexible in a lot of ways because as you've heard from Matt, you know, we, we like to you know, structure our collections in, in a different ways that are unique to the institution. Uh, so we will get to that in the next version. However, we also looked at workflows and roles. One of the new roles we have in Elvis is called institutional moderator was kind of a link between uh, the Elvis and the uh, institution. And this allowed for flexibility across different uh, call types, TA and VA. And underneath the moderator, we have the VA and TA coordinator 
uh, who could administrate the calls in progress, answer questions. And we had to transfer uh, these roles in a, in a system. So we use something called Keyclock, which is an open source role management system. When you log in, it, it goes through that. Currently, we have a username and password based system. However, we're uh, going to be starting a pilot soon to take this to the next level with single sign on and federated identity, and including ORCID ID and stuff like that. So that's the next uh, plan. Some highlights uh, from our Elvis 1.0, the TA procedure was, was much more user friendly than the previous iteration. And one of the most important thing is that you can name multiple institutions across Europe in just one application. And that makes, uh, again, one unified case. And we had a chat and comments thread that could be annotated during the application process during your collaboration with colleagues from other institutions. So that made it a very fluid and live process. Uh, this happened you know, before it was finalized to, to, for submission. So this was a very important feature that, that uh, people liked. Even though there's variation, we tried to create a standardized workflow for this application process, regardless of what institution you are working with, you could still submit that. And the role for the moderators also provided opportunity to, uh, for them to come and edit, you know, to, to update the service they're offering at the local level. And the test environment was important. We asked experts across a variety of disciplines to respond to the wireframes and test platforms. And this also allowed us to think about this what if questions and, and issues before we uh, publish this as, as, a, as the new live version. So it's clear and obvious that we need the collection specialist, we need the experts to be engaged in this development effort and Elvis is truly a collaborative uh, project where we're building the system for us, with us, you know, it, it, is, it is very important because collection specialists are important to understand the collection access platform. And of course, we need to accommodate variation, even though a lot of things need to be standardized, uh, but this variation of accommodation is important uh, for the buy-in of the platform, which will happen over time and through use. Uh, our future plans, uh, we're talking with the GBIF, CTAP and DISCO to, to understand where the institution collections uh, level data should come from and how the workflow will, will go through Elvis. And of course, the next big challenge is to design the loans system. As you know, the regulation and workflows around collection loans are very specific. So that needs to be you know, really carefully designed. So we will embark on the phase two development soon. There are some delays due to COVID and other changes, uh, but we will announce more on this uh, soon. And I want to thank my co-authors and also the partners from WP6 and Picture Ray and also the Synthesis Plus project office for their support. And thank you. Thank you, Sharif. Um, we have a few minutes left, but I don't see any questions at the moment. So I think we can uh, move to the next uh, speaker. Who's Marijke Peterson? Yes, thank you. Um, um, thanks for organizing this session here, Wouter and um, Sharif, in the next couple of minutes, I would like to focus on one tool which is currently under development, which is a knowledge hub, a knowledge base. It was already mentioned at least in one talk. No, I think even two. So if uh, now my screen is frozen. Okay, so you see the next screen, I hope. Next slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, for more than 20 years, there was so much research done on natural science collection. I think if you followed the um, 
the conference so far, you realize that we do have a profound knowledge on standards, on tools, on best practices, and so many different things. And I think this is a really, really valuable source when um, we see this, this great endeavor like DISCO having this one-stop shop for our bio and geodiversity. But the problem is that most information is really widespread and not well documented. I think a couple of years ago, no project report got a DOI, so it is really not persistently accessible. And so we take over this, this challenge. I don't know. My screen always gets frozen. I don't know what happened here. Okay, I will do it like this. So we are taking this this challenge, and um, we will we are aiming to provide a central and freely accessible hub for knowledge management to provide a really unified access uh, to research outputs and technical documentations. So we will allow for knowledge transfer among projects because all the results should not only be limited to one project, but also to, to others. And so that we can guarantee really a transfer of knowledge among partners, among people. And in the end, um, we aim to have a kind of enables, uh, to enable a sustainable and trusted and curated source of information for all the work with and on data, which are associated with our natural science collection objects. Um, to approach this, uh, we use the preparatory phase of DISCO for a Knowledge Hub pilot. So we run a really comprehensive requirement analysis, set common priorities, so together with partners, and throughout the process, we make our findings and the concepts and also the development process really open. And we always invite people also beyond the project to contribute and share their thoughts. In the beginning, of course, we were thinking of, okay, what kind of information would you like to share in this kind of knowledge hub? So, which is focusing, of course, on research infrastructures like DISCO. And people named like tools, collaborative writing, but of course, also research results, milestone reports, deliverables, data standards, and so on. This is a great variability of information. And as a next step, we clustered them and defined information types because most of them, you can at least uh, combine them with others. For example, you have here in the upper part, the information type documents. And this could either be a report from a project, but it could also be a policy or a best practice. And um, you see even here, there's a variability of information types and all of them need a home. And the first one we started with was documents because there was a high priority. There was a high need to find a home for all those different documents from research projects and so on. And um, after several meetings, uh, we decided to use DSpace. DSpace is an um, open source repository software package, and it is typically used for creating open access repositories for scholarly and or published digital content. So this sounds already quite promising, and even more than 1,000 instances are running worldwide. But it was not just a simple decision. We had in total 11 candidate systems we had a closer look to. And we tested them against our requirements and priorities. And so we started um, to use to run this pilot with DSpace. But here are more information types which need a home. So like software code and all technical documentations, which was already mentioned, like Basharif for Elvis, this is done in, in GitHub. And of course, it should remain in GitHub, but we will link to the different GitHub repos through our DSpace instance. So then also those repositories would be searchable through this um, main system. 
Other parts which were already shown by Sharif at this use case, they were not only collected for, for Elvis, but also for other parts of the research infrastructure DISCO. And they are all available in GitHub and um, can be linked to that by the DISCO knowledge base. The different e-services um, will of course also be uh, linked to, but they are creating documents and best practices and they can directly be integrated in into the knowledge base. There's always exchange with all those different e-services developed and maybe to a later stage, there might be a closer collaboration. Um, the same applies for training. Um, CTEF is maintaining a training platform called DEST. <clears throat> But um, so far, we are just integrating all those different documents. But DEST is running on Moodle, and there's a plugin available for Moodle in DSpace. So also in a later step, we could think of integrate this directly into the DSpace instance. Several people were inquiring um, a tool for, more, um, for the collaborative writing. To be honest, this was not. Um, not our aim to provide this in our knowledge base, but I think it's great to think about to provide an infrastructure people can use. So I think Google Doc is uh, still used by so many different people, but there are also other shared documents. And we agreed that we will run a pilot where we will provide space um, where people can add metadata and also the owner of that Google spreadsheet or document, and then we could add this uh, to the knowledge base, including a link um, to that document. And so people might find their Google Docs again, even if it was sent to them a couple of weeks ago in an email. I think it's, it's just a pilot, we will test that. And finally, data standards, of course, if it's just a description of a data standard, this is um, can be part of a Q&A section or a glossary and directly in the DSpace instance. But if it is coming to the modeling and the division uh, definition of single elements, this will all be done usually in GitHub, especially if we are talking about Tetrix standards. So I think with this, uh, we covered more or less all requirements we had in the beginning. And um, it's a good minimal viable product we can start with. Currently, the knowledge base is structured in, in different kind of groups. So we have our Disco Link projects like Disco Prepare, Synthesis, Bicycle, and so on, where people can make their project outcomes um, accessible. We have areas for policies, areas for Disco technical uh, things like code and technical documentations, a starting point for people being new to, to Disco or to our community in general with FAQs and glossary, but also training material. And as I said earlier, links to the relevant e-services and also to the um, GitHub repository of um, Disco in general. In this... Um, in this knowledge base, you have this kind of different content items. Um, they come along with a set of standardized metadata, including an identifier, an author title, abstract license, and so on. And then usually you have an associated document, which might be a project deliverable, which has been uploaded um, to the knowledge base, or in case it is already published somewhere with a per persistent identifier, like in Sinodo, we only link to that kind of external resources. Uh, per default, everything is public. There is an internal space, but so far um, it is not much used. For new content, um, we set up a GitHub repo issue template so people can make us aware whether new information should be part of that. Um, knowledge base. And we are now starting the, the curation of content as a collaborative effort. So we are reaching out in the first step to our um, Disco Link project partners um, to curate all those different content which is coming up. The main task of that um, knowledge base development ends already by the end of January next year. And um, by that time, or until that time, we will work on um, improving the usability and beautifying also the front end with the web developer team. 
and testing, of course, and evaluating the implementation set for the different information types. In general, I think it, it is a really useful information hub for all people working with and conducting research on natural science objects. And this is not only limited to um, those engaging with DISCO, I think it's important for those worldwide. And in a later step, I think it should be always be a bit community driven and also the curation. I could think of kind of an editorial board for new content for those kind of knowledge bases. So, and if you have anything in mind, what could, could be part of the knowledge base, just let us know. And as I said, we are beautifying the knowledge base, but it is already available under node.disco.eu, but um, it will change in the upcoming weeks and at least in the next two months. Uh, with this, I really, um, I thank my co-authors of this talk and um, the task partners, but also the DISCO technical team and people also beyond the project who were part of um, the roundtable and all hands meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Marika. I see no questions in the Q&A, so um, let's go to the next uh, speaker. That's the last speaker in the session. Uh, that's Dragon Ivanovic. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me and you can see my slides. So I'm going to talk about one uh, result of a mobilized cost action, which is a guideline for long-term preservation and hiring of products from scientific collections facilities. So uh, this is a collaborative work, of course, of the complete group inside the Mobilize, but also we received some comments and feedbacks outside of Mobilize cost action. And um, all those comments are resolved and integrated in the, in the guideline by the editorial team. And you can see here the, the authors of this presentation are actually the members of that editorial team. Uh, some of them are actually here also in me, participating in this, in this um, call, in this session. So it's uh, Dagmar, Gila, Dragan, Sven, and Tanya. And you can see the last names of those people. Um, just briefly, briefly for the people who don't know, uh, who didn't hear about the mobilized cost action. Um, the, it's an abbreviation for mobilizing data policies and experts in scientific collections. And one of the objectives of this cost action is to work on documents for expert training and educational purposes with broad involvement of professionals from the participating European countries. Um, you can find at this slide also the link to the website of this mobilize action. And of course, in the context of this section, the, the guideline which I'm going to present to you is actually, has been produced. Actually, at the moment we have just the draft version, but we are working further on that. And hopefully soon we will have the final version, which will probably after that disseminate, of course, through different channels. So of course, it's not the, the only result and only document of the cost section, but it's one of the documents produced by this cost section. And then I'm going to, to talk about this guideline. So what is the, the goal or, or the aim of this guideline? Um, the guideline should address the principal strategies and standards for long-term preservation and archiving um, of uh, data products. And those data products can be published or even unpublished. Um, so the target digital object types addressed by this guideline are primarily data products called digital specimens and digital collections with the persistent identifier assigned assignment lying under the authority of scientific collection facilities. Um, data construct or data products, how we define that in the guideline is any entity of data that is built through the acquisition, curation, processing, publishing, uh, and or by using analysis of data. So it, it can be some multimedia, it can be uh, digitalized um, specimens, or it can be, uh, I don't know, some data set and so on. 
So anything relating, relating to the digital specimens. Um, who we targeted actually with this guideline? Who can, who, who could have uh, some benefits from this guideline? Uh, primarily, the benefits should be for curators and individual researchers at natural scientific collection facilities. But also we uh, address some other stakeholders who might have some benefits from this guideline. Um, and um, there is also one section in the, in the guideline about the stakeholders and um, mapping, let's say, some key messages from our guideline. Um, for those stakeholders, meaning, um, for instance, for data creator and provider, those section and those messages might be um, usable uh, when they are working with um, archiving and long-term preservation. The guideline um, has five sections. The first section is giving some, let's say, context of the guideline. So talking about some background and um, defining the aim of the guideline. Then we have a, one short section, let's say, in glossary, describing the basic concepts used in the, in the rest of the guideline. And then there are two, let's say, productive um, chapters. Maybe we can say the main chapters, um, which defined the um, majority of the key messages of the guideline. Um, and then at the end, we have um, stakeholders. And as I mentioned, how the, the messages are mapped to, to different stakeholders. And also in the last chapter, we discussed a little bit about the costs, because for some stakeholders, of course, they, they would like to somehow estimate and to know how, how, um, how to plan the cost for long-term preservation and archiving. Um, we are using the concept of messages in order to try to better organize the, the, the document and to make it more readable for um, readers, meaning um, easily consumable by readers. So those messages are some kind of, you know, uh, key messages which you would like to bring home, for instance, from some conference, something similar is in this document. So we are trying to uh, somehow extract the key messages which you would like that the readers bring uh, after the reading of our, our guideline or some section in the guideline. Uh, and the, the majority of the messages are actually in the section three and section four. In the section five, there is only the mapping of those messages to the different stakeholders. This is one example of that message. For instance, it's a guideline message number 12. And you can read it here. So software solutions creating open archive file formats should be used for implementation of long-term preservation pipelines and resulting digital objects should have standardized formats for distribution of data. Uh, this will, and the reason why this is important, this will reduce the imminent, imminent risk of software and file format obsolescence. Before this message, of course, there is um, some text describing the problem, describing the um, background and, and um, available solutions at the moment. And then at the end, you have some message. We try to define those messages that are that wouldn't be out of date, let's say, after some time, meaning we try to skip adding uh, explicit some format or some tool or some um, digital library format or something as that in the message itself to make it uh, more, try to make it more generic and applicable also in the future. Um, so the third section, the first, let's say it's section with a lot of messages uh, is discussing general aspects of long-term preservation and archiving. And there are three subsections. And in those three subsections, we define some messages and discuss the different aspects general aspects of long-term preservation and archiving. Uh, after that is the, the section number four, um, which is dealing with the logical and functional aspects of long-term preservation and archiving of data constructs from scientific collections facilities. 
And again, we have here a couple of subsections and discussion about um, different aspects of different logical and functional aspects. Um, I already mentioned that the, there is also the, the, the section about stakeholders and um, how they should produce, um, consume the messages from the, the, the document, from the guideline. And in this uh, section, we have some subsections um, for each identified group of stakeholders. And in those subsections, we briefly describe the, 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 the type of stakeholder and the, the role of that stakeholder working with those um, specimens and facilities. And then try to describe the, which, which messages, previously mentioned messages might be of uh, might be useful for them and how. And also there is one section for the cost involved in the archiving process. Um, so definitely, you know, uh, archiving is a long-term commitment. It should be planned ideally for de decades in advance, not just for years. And then um, financial aspects should be also plan for decades, which is not always an easy task, which means the financing should not depend on insecure funding sources. That was one of our conclusions, meaning uh, if you have one project, which will be over in four years or something as that, funded by European Commission or something as that, what will happen after that, that's the key question. So if you're planning to establish a system for long-term preservation and archiving, what will, what will happen when the, uh, the, the project is over? Do you have appropriate sustainability plan? Also, um, some costs can be changed over time. So some new costs can appear in, in the future. And of course, cost scale with the amount, structure and format of data. And it also can include some other parameters. So, as I mentioned, this is still in a draft version, let's say. We organized the one workshop a couple of months ago to try to collect the feedback for the guideline. At the moment, um, about 30 mobilized working group four group members from 20, 12 countries, um, let's say, take, took a part in this uh, document, meaning provide some comments on participating in that workshop, in the discussion, that workshop, and so on. And of course, we also, I think, received some, some um, feedback and comments outside of, the, of this group in the, that workshop, because that workshop was open also for other people. Uh, our plan is to publish the final publication, hopefully soon, at Zenodo. And of course, um, to try to disseminate that, disseminate that as much as possible using different channels, including to add the link to the Zenoido document at the DISCO knowledge base. Um, at the end, just the brief acknowledgements. As I mentioned, this is the part and this is the result of mobilized action. Unfortunately, in the last one year and a half, we didn't organize the physical meetings due to the COVID pandemic situation, but anyway, the mobilized uh, action uh, gather us together uh, and we started working on this interesting topic and it's very nice that you know as, as in all action cost action you have people coming from different backgrounds working on the common goal for instance um, i'm a technical guy coming from the faculty of technical sciences and uh, the digital archives, you know, the long-term preservation was a common term for me. Uh, I'm teaching my students also about those concepts, but I have never applied that for uh, this domain. Um, I suppose uh, uh, we can also share the, the link to the uh, draft version of the document here in the chat, and anyone is, of course, welcome to comment that document, and we will try to address the comments as, as, uh, as better as we can. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any question, you can ask now, of course, or, or contact us later.
Thank you, Dragan. That was very interesting. Um, we still have some time left uh, for questions and a little bit of discussion. Uh, I saw one question uh, from Dimitri Brosens in the question and answers section um, that may be interesting to uh, reflect a bit upon. Um, uh, Dimitri was, was asking what the, the main goal is of, of Disco here to, uh, to publish data as fair data or as fair data and open data. Um, he was getting confused a bit about that. Um, my answer to that would be um, to, that the, the goal of DISCO is to publish all our data or make all our data available um, as fair data. Um, that does not necessarily mean that all the data that we will make available through DISCO is open. So we still want to be as open as possible, uh, but in some cases it's just not, not possible to, to publish all data as, as open data. Of course, there are some uh, things that you can do uh, to still serve uh, the, the data as far as possible. Uh, that's something that is also being done in, 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 uh, in GBIF, where uh, data sets are uh, often uh, published uh, without the exact locations uh, of, of the, the species, for instance, but uh, the data is still um, uh, having a granularity that's useful for, for global uh, scientific uh, questions. So it may not be uh, usable for all scientific questions, uh, but you can still use it for part of, of the science. Um, we will not publish all our data in, in DBIF or, or make it available in DBIF uh, because not all our data is biodiversity data. Uh, we also uh, intend to include uh, collections that are um, about um, earth collections, uh, mineral collections, uh, etc. Uh, and we can just not not publish them in uh, in GBIF uh, because that's not not the GBIF scope. Also, we want to um, to make uh, specimens discoverable uh, as soon as we have some information available um, about them, and that information may just be that. Um, uh, that we can review that a specimen uh, exists at a certain uh, institution. Uh, that information is not yet relevant to share with, uh, with DBIF, it's just not enough information. Um, we will still make that available within in, in DISCO, but um, uh, only when more uh, information, uh, scientific re relevant information is known about the, that particular object it will be relevant to, to share that with uh, um, aggregators like, uh, like DBIF. I hope that uh, that answers the question. Um, I, so also a question related to, to, to MITS, whether MITS uh, is also, would also be useful in, in other disciplines. Um, Elspeth, is that something that you would like to um, to reflect upon? Yes, I mean, it's it's kind of come up a bit um, in other discussions. Um, and I think that, yeah, I, mean, I think MIDS as a concept is, I would say, very relevant to other other disciplines, other other types of, of collections, whether that's cultural heritage collections or whether it's the library collections that Nikki was asking about. Um, and I think I think it was a it was a nice thing to raise, and I think it's something that we can include in the discussion in the working session in November. I think it would be a useful part, thing to discuss and to include in that discussion. Um, yeah, I was just thinking there was another there was another um, question in another bit of discussion in there as well that I was just trying to remember, but I I can't remember the other bit of discussion that was in there. Um, just one second while I try and um, oh, go into the into it here. Am I seeing the the question here? Just <laughs> uh, I think it was um, about the digitally born objects. Yes, thank you. Yes, I think that was the that was the other point. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, yes, I think that is also. Um, 
a nice a nice point to raise as well that I think MIDS um, could be usefully um, used for digitally born elements as well. Um, so I, I don't I don't think they could they would have to be excluded from MIDS at all. Um, I think MIDS should work for those as well. And again, we can include that in the discussion in the in the November session. There were nice points to raise. Thank you. There's a question for Dragon. Uh, it's asking, uh, what do you think will be the most difficult for the people organization in the DISCO network for, for archiving purposes? I don't know. I mean, um, at the end, when we completed this, the, 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 the guideline, I think the people from the DISCO might, you know, read the guideline and see whether some of the, our messages can be applied for their domain. But um, as I mentioned, I'm not coming from that uh, natural science side, let's say, and um, I'm not so much familiar with the um, disco itself. And I, I heard for, for the first time about the disco actually at this mobilized cost action. So I'm afraid that I'm lacking the details to respond to, to this, your question directly, but maybe we can discuss when this guideline is over and then uh, let's say try to, to get more details about the disco and uh, everything other about that and then maybe to provide the answer. Okay, uh, I see no further questions. Uh, I have a question to, to all the, the presenters. Um, if you think of the, the current developments that we have in, in, in the TEDFIC standards development, like, like MITS uh, and uh, the collection descriptions uh, work, um, and the services that are currently under development in, uh, in DISCO for the global community, uh, are there any things that you are missing there that we that you think that we should should pick up in terms of standards development or, or services development? Sorry, can I can I come in on this one? Yes, of course. Um, I think for mids, I think what's um, where we are looking at the the mids elements, and there's been some discussion about about those and some of the um, how those would be mapped to existing existing standards and terms. Um, for example, Darwin Core or ABCD. Um, so I think there's that's going to be an interesting thing to be looking at. One thing um, to be clear is that mids is a measure of complete completeness, not data quality, and I think that's where sometimes some of that has come into discussion um, and we need to make sure that those things are, are kept separate. So um, we can say that a, a, an information element is present in the data, but we wouldn't necessarily, we can give recommendations about what the information we would expect to see in there, but we're not necessarily saying, okay, this is a controlled vocabulary that, that, that has to be used. For that, for that mids element, that is part of a different a different group. So I think, but I think the that's that's an area that controlled vocabulary area I think is is going to be um, key in in moving forwards and to align our data and make it more interoperable. I think that that and so that we can map our data. Um, so I think that kind of discussion is going to be has been taking place for years, and I, but I think it's going to become more important as we move forwards. Um, the other thing that um, people may have noticed with MIDS is that MIDS is, is what moment we just got the presence or absence of an image. Um, and I think I would imagine that we, we're going to have something like MIDS-C, um, which is the minimum, minimum information about a digital specimen image, and that we're going to need to actually work much more on standards for images. I think that's going to be something that we, would, we will need to work on as we move forwards so that we know what kind of image we're talking about, whether it's a whole specimen image, whether it's a microscope image, a detail image, a, a field image, you know, there's, there's so many different kinds of images and we'll, we're going to need the standards for, for those images, what they are, and also what metadata associated with them. 
Okay, thanks, uh, Alfred. Alfred, do you think that uh, a, an image should be a separate object from a digital specimen that uh, you would want to uh, to cite uh, in, in publications individually? Or should it That's be a part? big question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very big question, and um, I think needs thought. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to answer just off the hoof, but someone else might have a thought on that. <laughs> I don't know. I think since you have usually even several images um, related to one digital specimen, I. I would assume, yes, it would be really useful to cite um, even single images, but also just a personal opinion. <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking, so this also probably brings in the IIIF um, community as well, in terms of how we manage those images and how we, how we um, link images as well. So yes. Yeah, okay. so I think I would I would agree with Marika on this one. <laughs> Let's see that the conclusion is yes. Um, I see no further questions from the audience. Um, is there anything from the speakers uh, which you would like to to bring in as questions, maybe, or as uh, further comments? I think I want to highlight what our keynote speaker said about just understanding the local context. So I think also it's important what we learned from Elvis and other service development that, that it's important to really learn from the people that are they're actually doing things. So, so we need to, I think, basically go out there and, and talk to the people for all, all the development. So, yeah. Okay. I think it might also be interesting to highlight um, something which is kind of an intersection between my topic and Elspeth's topic, which has before but not really been developed, which is the concept of how could you do a minimum information for a digital collection? Is, there, is the MIDS concept mappable to collection descriptions so that we could have something similar or does the, you know, the, the difference in how digital specimens and how collections are arranged and interact in terms of data means that we need to do something different, say maybe on an implementation by implementation basis. Could we only do, do that kind of scheme before DISCO because it's a certain set of collection descriptions use cases or is that something which could also be some kind of globally useful indicator as well? So I think it'll, it'll be interesting to pull that conversation up again as well. And I think so. I'm just going to come apply to to Sharif as well. I think I think going to the to the going to the the, the users and the people actually um, working with the the collections and the data, particularly in terms of mids, I think is really important, um, so that we do get it it actual um, it can be implemented. I think that's going to be critical to, so that we can, particularly for mids level one, we need mids level one to be able to be implemented by pe by the by the community. Um, so I think we've been having some one to ones with the with the um, institutes to, to talk through the different elements and how they're interpreting them within the institutes and how they can achieve them. And I think that process, I mean, it's been so valuable to get that. The, the responses and the discussions, there's been a lot of things come up from those that are really useful um, kind of insights. And I think I think that I would I would definitely um, emphasize with as Sharif has done the importance of actually going out and speaking to to the people. I think hugely important. Okay, thank you, Elspeth. Uh, there is a, a comment in the chat uh, related to the citing of, of images. Um, that uh, it's it's very important to cite exactly the same object, and that uh, it may be a good idea to to uh, to cite the the checksum or, or hash of the the object. Uh, and, and the hash or, or checksum is of course something that we can. Uh, 
include in the, the metadata uh, of the of the pit record for the object as well. And then that's basically something that we have been discussed already to uh, to do. That may be a good uh, thing to do for the, the images. Okay, um, if there are no um, other remarks, then I think that we can safely uh, end the, the session. I would uh, thank again all these speakers for their contributions and uh, the audience for uh, for listening and, and uh, asking questions. And um, enjoy the rest of the TETRIC meeting. Thank you all. Bye.